and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Dark Fury's publishing, the and creator of the upcoming Centennia role-playing game, which we'll be getting into today, the one and only Brian Mosley. How are you doing today, man? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you very much for, for having me today. Thank, thank you for coming on and braving the hell of time zones. Even if it's a one-hour difference, it's, st it's still time zone hell. Yeah, it's it's uh it's not too bad though. It's a it's a nice relaxing day. Yeah. So, I guess I'll open with the humble beginnings in a sense. I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Well, I first uh, first started playing uh, role playing games when I was uh, I was still a teenager. I had. Uh, um, I joined the Navy and uh, I got in with uh, with some some good folks and uh, started learning to play different uh, fantasy role playing games and uh, you know it just uh, it inspired me. I've always thought that role playing games are a lot like uh, actors on a on a theater stage who you know they're just given an idea of what their character is and they say okay talk for the night and they just uh, you know they just go through and they ad lib and they build off of one another's stories and. And I just think that it's a wonderful creative outlet. Mm -hmm. So, with the, with that said, uh, it def talk me about talk with me about how Centennia came about because this is because doing jumping from the typical reigns of fantasy to this sort of science fiction is a interesting journey and since and since centennia is is about a journey so that's a bit um apropos well you know interestingly enough uh when i first started on this uh, quite a few years ago uh what i wanted to do was i i wanted to create you know a a better uh, game system and I felt that I could. I, uh, uh, I don't know how. I don't know for sure how right I was, but I, I felt that I could. And uh, for a number of years, that was my focus. I, I spent uh, a very long time working on uh, the concept of the character creation and going from there because I've uh, I played a lot of uh, role playing games and uh, a number of them very very crunchy role playing games, and I realized, uh, as a game master in particular, that uh, that those very rules heavy uh, role playing games can offer a great deal of challenge to a casual player, and I wanted to create something that uh, that didn't provide an, what I kind of felt was an, an unfair opportunity where a, uh, a player who reads every single word in your rule book will end up with a, a, a greater knowledge and therefore you know, be able to make a, a more sub substantial character than a casual uh, player. And I feel that while you know there's, there's nothing wrong with reading the rules, I mean, I, I think everybody should read them, but when I say casual player, it's the player who, for whatever reason, doesn't want to necessarily make the most optimized character or the, or the most powerful character. And so I wanted really my focus to be on making what I felt was a good uh, game system. And uh, once, I had, uh, once I had done that, I was faced with the realization that I had to create a campaign setting because originally I just wanted to create uh, just the the game system, and the further along I got with it, the more it matured and evolved, the more I came to the realization I had to create a game system, mm -hmm. or excuse me, a, a a campaign setting, and so 
I didn't want to I didn't want to do fantasy. And ironically, I didn't want to do science fiction. Uh, I was interested in um, a little bit more of a of a horror theme, uh, but not necessarily in your face horror so much as a suspense. And Centennia, uh, while it does, uh, while it is most accurately based as a as a science fiction genre, um, technology is not at the forefront, and um, it's because I didn't want to create a brand new world that uh, players have to just suddenly pretend that they know all about this world, that their character's grown up in it from the beginning, and they know all of these different cities and so forth and so on. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted something that that was different. And so that led me to be, well, I, I do want to create you know, a, a unique setting. I don't want it to be on earth. I don't want it to be something where everybody just suddenly has to uh, absorb all of this information. And how can I, how can I achieve that? So uh, that's how it came to be. Science fiction was through the process of elimination of what do I not want it to be? What, if I were going to play it, what, you know, what would I want to see? And that's how that's how it came into being as a uh, as a science fiction uh, genre. Mm -hmm. And you're you're probably familiar with the concept of Appendix N. I'm I'm terribly sorry. I'm I'm not though. This this was this was a section in in some in the very early iterations of D&D &D that contained contained a list of um, in, of in, essentially inspirational media whether that be books whether that be television whether that be film and and so, so on um, you have you have a similar kind of inspirational media list in some editions of Call of Cthulhu and most of the old white wolf books that I have um, what would be some of the what would be some of the material that you would you would say would draw that would draw that similar parallel to the world that you're creating with Centennia. That's that's a difficult question. Um, I I did uh, I've always enjoyed reading uh, reading science fiction. Um, I've enjoyed reading some fantasy. Uh, of course, obviously enjoyed reading uh, Lord of the Rings and um, and. I've played a few uh, science fiction uh, tabletop RPGs through the years, and um, and it just really got to where a lot of it just felt very similar to me, and so it's hard it's hard for me to say where I pulled in for ins uh, inspiration from. Uh, I guess uh, a little bit of. Uh, a little bit, I would say, of uh, Doctor Who and um, uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine in the concepts where they have, uh, in the original Doctor Who, when the very first actor became ill and could no longer do the series, but it was a top-rated show, they needed to devise a way to continue the series without him. Mm -hmm. And so that led to the concept of uh, the character regenerating into a new incarnation of himself. And in... Uh, Deep Space Nine, they had the character of Dax, who um, had, I believe, it was a, I think they called it a trill uh, yep. that was in the body, and there was, a, and they, and there was a character who was a host to that, and um, and in Centennia, there is a concept that's going to that's going to be somewhat like that, uh, not quite like on a uh, invasion of the uh, body snatcher sort of way, but it, it will be thematically based that way. Um, so that's that's one inspiration. Uh, I also very much don't want technology to be at the forefront. So uh, in the uh, in the Centennial universe in the solar system where they've arrived, um, technology is is breaking down and it's breaking down quickly. And it's not going to send them back to the Stone Ages, but it is going to reduce them to a level of uh, of technology where 
uh, very sensitive uh, micro and nano electronics are, are very difficult to maintain. And so what that's going to do is that's going to allow the, uh, the person running the game and, and Centennial, it's called the guide. It's going to allow them a great deal of control over how they want to atmospherically, you know, uh, flavor their campaign. And, uh, and I guess that comes a little bit from possibly um, uh, like Firefly or possibly even Star Wars, where the focus is more on the characters and the environment, the setting, than it is about technology, where it's, and, and it's, there's nothing wrong with that. But like in Star Trek, it, oftentimes it felt like technology was very much at the forefront of the story. And, and that's what I don't want to have. Yeah. And when you sit when you say that the thing that instantly comes to mind is the techno babble issue that's come, that's come up over the years um right absolutely which for me for me that issue was was irksome for for a couple for a few reasons one of them being perpetuating this idea that technology is this sort of is this magic and all but name that mo that people normally can't understand uh the also, the fact that it's blatant padding, and um, the fact that to me it, it's antithetical to proper te to proper storytelling. You know, if you put your protagonist in a um, in a situation that they have to overcome, they they're usually supposed to either talk their way out, fight their way out, or think their way out. And you kind of undermine that when you get when you have what amounts to a Deus Ex Machina. Uh, som sometimes a bit more literal than others when it comes to that phrase, but you get the idea. No, absolutely, absolutely, and that was uh, that was something that I desperately wanted to avoid with Centennia. Mm -hmm. um, and for example, uh, I enjoy I, I've enjoyed playing Traveler a little bit through the years, um, but it, it shares a similar a similar concept with uh, with Star Trek in that it's 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 very. Uh, technology forward and as i said there's nothing wrong with that but but uh but i feel that it it allows for the possibility of the story to rely more on the technology than on the than on the characters and um and so for me i i really i really wanted to avoid that uh very much and the, the technology that i have put into centennia i've uh, i've done a lot of uh a lot of research online and uh, I, I intentionally don't uh, give an exact timeline for when Centennia, um, when Centennia comes about. I, I would think it would be anywhere from 75 to 100 years from now, but, uh, but the technology that is in the game largely is barely more than, than what we have today. And, and that's completely and absolutely intentional, uh, even to the point of, uh, you know, artificial gravity in space. Um, you know, one of the, uh, I'm sure you're aware, one of the, one of the better examples of how to treat that uh, realistically was in the ex Expanse novels and in, uh, and in the show. Although um, uh, they, they had their own, you know, technological, technology issues with uh you know with the speed and things like that and in centennia i really wanted to to make that you know a, a very definite thing you know going from uh say earth to mars in uh, in most science fiction would be a day or two and uh and in centennial where i've got the solar system developed out uh, going from the new world to the closest uh, other world is going to take you weeks, perhaps months, depending depending upon the craft that you're in. And uh, the concept with Centennia is that uh, they've arrived somewhere where they didn't intend to be, um, and they've got to make the best of the situation because the mothership, they couldn't remain there. So they took what they could, and they had to leave in a hurry. And that really puts everybody into kind of a common denominator of, well, here we are, you know, are we going to fragment? Are we going to work together? And 
technology being what it is and being constantly bombarded with um, energies that cause the technology to break down, you know, it, it's really going to be an issue where, you know, the characters have to make decisions. You know, do I want to to take that risk to try to go somewhere? You know, do I want to stay here? That sort of thing. But uh, But it's very much character and story driven. And keeping that in keeping that in mind, I'd like to sh I'd like to shift a bit into the en into the engine the Tengen system as you call as you referred to it. Um, and kind kind of get the feel for where for where the um core, where the core of it the core resolution is because. I'm not sh now I'm not sure when this started but at at some point um the design within the design within game mechanics shifted away from a collection of subsystems like you would see in a like you would see in AD&D and shifted into this idea of a l mostly unifying mechanic with some some exceptions but one particular one that um everything else is built around through different contexts whether this be uh, whether this be using a d20, using a using a pool of d10s, and so and so on. With the tension, what what would you say is the all roads lead to Rome sort of mechanic in that system? Okay, well, uh, well, it is a, it is a dice pool of uh, ten sided dice, and it is a uh, it is a skill based system. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, First of all, there there are no aliens in Centennia. There are there's a remains of uh, of an alien civilization on the planet, or what appears to be the remains of an alien civilization on the planet. So all the characters are human, and they have uh, you have four stats, which are fit two physical and two mental, and then there are um, each one of those stats has two derived attributes. And uh, you have a uh, you have a uh, what essentially not a point buy but a a point uh, placement system for your stats, and uh, uh, you get you get ten points to assign to your stats. So there's five possible arrays, mm -hmm. and then there's a a limit on how high those stats can go, um, and that's based on you know if, if it's four more than what you had into it. So uh, if you start with a four in one in one of your attributes, it maxes out at an eight. If you started out with a one, it's going to max out at a five. And so that that gives you your attributes mm -hmm. and your at or excuse me your stats. And then each one of those stats, as I said, had two attributes, and you just simply take the number of points in your stat, split it among those two attributes. So these numbers are pretty low. Mm -hmm. And these comprise two of the 10 possible components that you can have mm -hmm. whenever you get ready to roll a dice pool. Mm -hmm. there, are a, uh, there are also, in a similar concept to the way that I, that I described, uh, stats and attributes, you have skills, which each have uh, two to four skill fields in them. And it's a sim similar concept where you can have from one to eight ranks in a skill and then you split however many ranks you have into the attributes. And then you have uh, some other uh, components, such as luck, which is a trait that you can, can purchase and uh, buy ranks in. Um, interest, which is a kind of a, uh, a revolving uh, pool where you can say, I want this many points of my interest to be in this skill. Mm -hmm. And then during every downtime, you can slightly rebuild your character. You don't lose any points for doing this. And so it allows you to completely evolve your character over time. But the dice pool system uh, uses six 10-sided dice. Mm -hmm. And there are up to 10 possible components that you can choose from, from which to comprise your, your numbers that you want to uh, when you roll your dice, either achieve 
those numbers equal to that or less than that. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, and other uh, components that you could use in that would be, as I said, your luck, uh, your interest, uh, aptitude, which is a trait in which uh, you can buy ranks in it. You can have it for just one skill, which allows you to become very good at a at one or two skills. Mm-hmm. Um, and you can also have, uh, you also get experience, which is based upon the amount of uh, build points that you get. Um, build points, I call them build points instead of like experience points because uh, uh, there are uh, there are robots in the game. They're, all, they're always called drones, but there are robots. And, um, and they, they also are built on a uh, build point system. Mm-hmm. And at the end of every game session, you will get one, two, or possibly three build points. And then uh, you can slowly buy ranks in the skills and the traits that you want. And the more build points you get, uh, for every 20 you get, you get one one experience. So your can, experience can go all the way up to eight, you know, once you've got a, 160 build points. And these, the scores of these components as I've described to you, those are the six scores that you use whenever you roll your six 10 sided dice. And while there are um, modifiers that will cause you to have to um, increase a number on your dice, which is not good for you or decrease a number on your dice, which is good for you. Aside from those, um, there are no other modifiers. You never add more dice in, you never take any dice away. And so you always roll six dice. Even if you come up and you say, well, I've got, I've got this number in my stat and I've got this number in my attribute and I've got this number in my skill and this number in my skill field and the other two are zero, that's fine. Even if you don't have the skill, that's fine because a zero on a dice is always a win because if you've got a zero in your component, it's still a win. That's that's. That's a success. Uh, conversely, if you roll a nine, it's always a fail. So, and that also works very well with uh, items that have potential fail rates, like uh, electronics that can that can fail, that can break. And so, you're always going to know. Um, I'm going to roll six dice. I may have to add add some po- add numbers or take numbers away from my result. But I always know I'm going to roll six dice. I always know a zero is a success, a nine is a fail. Anything else, I match it up to my numbers. And if it's equal to or less than those, then it's a success. And that's the way the system works in every situation. So it is, it is essentially an a, it is essentially a, a 60-10 approach that you are aiming low. Exactly, yes. Oh. And given that, would it be fair of me to, to assume that the difficulty of rolls is is going to be based on hits? Oh, I know, I yeah, know, yes. in so, I know some may call it successes or, or the like. I just, I just use hits as a habitual thing. Oh, um, is it is it a case where, um, what where like it like a difficulty one would be the would be trivial and six would be the not the um nigh insurmountable kind of difficulties that's exactly correct there's also a um there's also a an element in the game called morale mm-hmm. uh which uh which you will get a point of morale after a week of downtime because you know from your rest and recovery um if you happen to get uh um an expensive item for example in the game and everybody decides okay we're we're going to uh we're gonna you know we're gonna trade this off and we're gonna we're gonna get some type of boon for it whether it's a nice uh a nice you know relaxing you know vacation for a few days or whatever something to improve your spirits then you you get a point of morale and this is uh um this is important because uh you can you can use a point of morale before you ever roll a dice pool to say, I want to give myself one win right now, straight up before I even roll. And I, I, they're called wins in the games, uh, his successes, same concept. 
And so uh, you can have anywhere from uh, uh, from one up to potentially uh, seven successes. Mm-hmm. And that, and of although ha- although having having seven would would be would be a case of easier said than done the way you describe it because it means all the you have to ha- you have to spend that morale and all six die have to hit. That's correct, and in fact, um, some of the technological advancement, uh, because as I said, when when the colonists leave the mothership, they don't have very much. Uh, they've actually got, uh, uh, totally excluding the, the mothership itself, they were able to uh, take less than half of the, uh, of the vessels that were there. They were able to take very little of the actual uh, resources that they really need to get started. So... Uh, it's going to be very difficult for them, plus the fact that that the uh, that the environment is con- continually destroying the, you know their their electronics. So when they want to tr- when when guides want to begin to say, well, I want to allow my my campaign to begin developing, say, a uh, a more advanced research bay or you know some type of a uh, facility bay or a facility station. That's where those numbers are going to have to come into play, where it's going to be a very tremendous effort to make something like that. It's going to take time. It's going to take uh, everything that they can muster. And, and that's not just in the, in the guide's cast, which guide's cast are the collection of characters that populate the, the background. It's also going to be uh, the characters of the players, you know, they're, if they want to achieve something really significant, then everything's going to have to go into it. And there's a lot of uh, mechanics built in for collaboration to to help facilitate that. So it's not just one person saying, OK, I'm going to go into my room with my, you know, my fancy dancy equipment and make this happen. Everybody can get involved because that's that's what to me, that's what an RPG is about is getting everybody involved. And with that, with that in mind, I'd like to I'd like to ask a bit a bit on um, on the on the nature of things when it comes to combat. Now, given given that core mechanic that you mentioned, is it a, is it a case where you're where you're utilizing the where does the where does say the atta- the um, Attack stat for the for the various weapons come into um, play. Okay, well the uh, combat is uh, uses uh, uses the tension system obviously, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and I am a, I am a strong believer in a uh, in a structured combat round, but I I want it to try to go quickly. Um, there are a number of uh, of wonderful uh, RPGs out there that combat can really uh, slow down the, uh, the pace of gameplay. So um, for Centennia, uh, it is based on uh, combat rounds, combat turns. There is a mechanic in there where at the beginning of your turn, you can say, uh, I want to go just one time in this uh, in this round, I want to go twice in this round, or I want to go up to three times in this round, and you make that choice, and and that's going to impact. It applies negative modifier negative modifiers to your rolls when you roll, but um, but your uh, uh, combat is is based on an attack roll, and there is no uh, opposing defensive roll. Because uh, when you when you create your character and you have your two physical stats and your two mental stats, those actually become your uh, your roles that will be tested in combat. So uh, so so you wouldn't roll to see if you dodge something. It would it would be dependent upon upon uh, upon that predetermined number. And when you when you have an attack roll, it's going to be uh, the associated stat is going to be based upon the uh, the weapon that you're using, and 
Uh, there are firearms. Uh, mm -hmm. Firearms will be based on uh, on one of those two stats. It would be based on the the more of the dexterity stat. I'll just call it that. And uh, if you're using a melee or a thrown weapon, then it's going to be more on the on the strength type of the stat. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there are no additional modifiers for um, for how high your stat is because your your stat directly affects um you know it, your chance of of, uh, of succeeding in your attack in the first place mm -hmm. and i'm gu i'm guessing to reinf to reinforce the th theming that you're going with damage is on the higher end of the equation uh, it is to a point uh i mean I'm not saying uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying down in a couple of hits. This isn't traveler or anything like that. Um, I would say two to three hits. You know, depending on what you're getting hit with, would be enough to to down a character. Um, however, there are there's a difference between going down and, and being dead. Um, there are uh, you can um, you can choose, for example. Uh, on any hit that you take, you can choose to spend your luck to on a one point one per uh, one point per one point basis. So let's say you have five points in luck, you could say I'm going to spend all five of that luck to just uh, to negate five points of the damage that I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. um, and your armor also, you know, will negate some of the damage that you take. You can also choose to um, to willingly reduce. Uh, one of your actual stats by one point, and that will negate a, a significant amount of the damage that you take. Mm -hmm. But you don't get that that uh, point of your stat back. It, it'll come back later on when you get to your next twenty point increment in your in your in your experience in your build points. Mm -hmm. So so there are a lot of ways that you can um, that you can help to mitigate the damage that you take, but there's no, uh, I'll say there's no such thing as a hit point mountain. You're, uh, uh, there is a trait that allows you to, uh, to increase your life, which, which gives you, if you will, more points to, uh, to absorb damage with. But, uh, but realistically about the most points you're ever going to have will be, uh, will be 24. Mm -hmm. And that, that's, when it, and when it comes to the heavier equipment, that's not exactly a high amount. Huh. It's not. It's not uh, one of the, uh, most of the uh, the uh, the really damaging firearms will uh, will do you know, six to, to ten points of damage, and uh, and you can also uh, the number of successes over what you need to succeed in your attack. That'll add a point of damage to it. Uh, any natural zero on your die roll will uh, will add an additional point of damage. So you know you could take you know ten, twelve points of damage in a single hit. Mm -hmm. Now, because of the fact that character creation is is largely point based, that can that can run the risk of. Uh, or the the possibility of risk of analysis paralysis. It could, and, but it's un, it's unlikely. I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, what I was going to ask is is um how is how you approach that, how you mit, how you mitigate that, because obviously I'm I'm looking thing I'm looking at things from a limited lens. Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, that was definitely one of the things I was concerned about. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with, uh, I guess you, a good term for it is, you know, min-maxing. Um, and there's, there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, but I do feel that, um, that it's important for characters to not be extremely, uh, extremely focused, extremely uh, vertically aligned in their abilities. In other words, uh, you shouldn't just be able to do one thing. You should be able to do other things as well. And I do offer a... Um, I do offer a suggestion to the guides in character creation that if they feel that, uh, you know, that they might encounter that problem, then uh, I do offer a brief, uh, uh, 
option for skill diversification where, uh, you know, where they, where characters, all right, if you're going to have a, like a five in one skill, then you need to have another skill that has a lower number in it, that sort of thing. And if guides want to use that, then, um, then they can, but they have to, you know, make sure that, you know, all the character that it applies equally. But as far as game mechanics to avoid that, um, as I had mentioned earlier, uh, your, your stats are going to range from one to eight. And when you start out at character creation, it's one to four. And, uh, and as you gain your build points, then you can potentially increase those numbers. Um, and your build points, it's actually based upon, not exclusively, but it's almost, almost exclusively based upon the age of your character at the start. Um, so if you start at 16 years old, you're going to have a very small experience pool. You can actually start as old as uh, as old as sixty, and you have a much much larger experience pool. But um, your stats also, because I wanted to I wanted to have a, a a limiting mechanic as you as you were talking about, but I wanted it to be very simple and straightforward, and it is. Um, if you uh, and it's based upon um, your. Uh, your attributes inside of your stats because you can choose to have a good or a poor attribute or not. So your skills, the only way you, uh, that you could achieve an eight in a skill is if you have a good attribute. But whenever you have a good attribute, you have to have a poor attribute. And the highest skill rating you can have for a poor attribute is a four. So outside of a good or a poor attribute, the highest rating of skill you can have is a six. So you can be the absolute best at anything. And over time, you can completely unlearn that skill and completely rebuild your stats and all your abilities to not even know that skill anymore and, and be completely versed into a different skill. So you can, you can be the best at anything, but you cannot be the best at everything mm -hmm. at the same time. There, is, there, there will never be one character that can always be the best at everything. Uh, so, continuing on from from that, what when I looked at the when I looked at the sample character sheet that's in the preview, um, I did notice the not, the notches that are that are that are under each of the core um, attributes under body, dexterity, mind, presence, as well as luck, life, and wealth. Is that is that intended to be how adva how advancement works, or is that a diff is that a different system? Um, if you're referring to the uh, the pips under like the body and the dexterity and mind mm -hmm. and presence, um, those are uh, those are the the actual uh, the actual number of ranks that you can have in those, mm -hmm. and the reason that those are there is. When uh, when your character and right now Centennia does not have any type of uh, I'll say mental combat or mental abilities in it, mm -hmm. but it's going to it's going to take a while for that to evolve, but it will. Um, so when you are involved in in combat or when you get hurt, um, that uh, injury is reflected in in your stats as well as in your life if you happen to have purchased uh, points in your or ranks in your uh, your life trait. So uh, when you get injured, uh, initially it's going to be um, it's going to be a, a, a non-lethal sort of injury um, with the possibility of uh, of some actual uh, potentially lethal injury in that the strain and wound and you actually mark those points off. So you have to decide where am I going to mark those points off? Mm -hmm. And so as you, as you go through combat and you get hit, whether it's punched in the face or, or whatever it is, um, your at your stats are going to, to decrease, which is fundamentally going to make it more difficult for you to respond or do, uh, any type of actions that require a dice pool roll, because then your stats have have diminished. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the way you describe that, it definitely reminds me of the um, the stat decrease approach that I've that you see in things like tra in things like Traveler. The that, mm -hmm, yes. Now, when you when you mention men when you mention mental combat, is this a case of like how some games will do social combat, or are you are you talking psychics? Um, in between that, uh, it's it's going to be more of a. Um, I don't want to get too much <laughs> into it because uh, I don't want to give away too many spoilers, but. Uh, um, uh, campaign wise there's an element that's that's going to cause this to begin to manifest mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take a little while and uh, and when it begins to manifest the the overall game mechanics are going to be that it's essentially going to increase uh, certain skills that you have which uh, you mentioned like uh, manipulating a social encounter uh definitely it's definitely right in that right in that area it's also um, going to be based upon the, the ability to to cause a great deal of stress upon someone where they don't really realize where that stress is coming from and so it's not going to be something like you know using my psychic ability to bend a spoon but it will be something where you can have a a tangible effect upon your ability to focus certain skills better and your ability to to hamper or hinder someone else or make them or make them more receptive to 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 what you want them to do mm -hmm. and the now given given that um Obviously, even with the technological effect that's ha that's happening with some with the more sensitive equipment, um, a lot of the, a lot of these types of science fiction games are are largely built around equi equipment and customization therein. And I did I did see a bit a bit of that with that chart on heavy weapons and grenades. Can I assume that when it when it comes to various equipments whether it be weapons armor or or vehicles there's means to means to uh, modify the parameters of them yes although that's it, uh there's not a an enormous amount of modification possible you can uh, you can choose to uh to upgrade a piece of equipment say for example and when you choose to upgrade it you upgrade one of the uh, characteristics of that item, but when you when you upgrade it, it's it has a point value to it. It'll either be one or two points, mm -hmm. and then you have to conversely apply a downgrade to that same item for the same amount of points. Mm -hmm. So if if you want to improve, uh, let's let's just say it, it's it's a firearm and you want to improve the, the the range increments and that cost you two points then you're going to have to choose one of the other uh or perhaps two uh other uh, characteristics of that item and decrease those in order to uh to pay for that um but if you do uh for example create your own item and you roll well enough in the creation of that item, you can create an exceptional item, which will uh, allow you a two-point upgrade on that item, and you don't have to pay anything else for it. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that, in, with that in mind, when it comes to the plant, the planet that th that these colonists have la have landed upon. Oh. I know. I know that you said you're not. We're not dealing with aliens, but I'd imagine there is still wildlife and other threats that have to be accounted for. That can be. That can be um, equally dangerous. That's correct. Uh, one of the things that uh, that is initially going to be uh, a mystery for guides and players alike is that uh, this planet, which is uh, which is called Gaia. Mm -hmm. um, once they 
Yeah, and this is this information is included in the day one uh, ed, uh, introductory adventure that's comp that's uh, included in the Colonist Companion. So uh, it's a uh, it's a complete introduction to to the Centennial Universe and the uh, and the New World, the solar system as a whole. And uh, because it begins uh, very, very, very shortly after uh, the colonists leave the mothership. And, uh, and one of the ways that the characters can enter into the campaign is uh, to be launched on one of the craft from the mothership as part of that exodus, actually coming uh, very shortly after the exodus which uh, opens up more questions of, uh, well, how did this happen? And uh, when they begin their descent to the new world, they do discover that a lot of this solar system has already, uh, they've already got astronomical data on, on the bodies within the solar system. And there are landing areas that were already pre-programmed into their ships. Uh, and there's, a very remarkably Earth-like biome on on the lar on one of the larger continents, and it is not um, it's not indigenous. It's clearly uh, flora and fauna from Earth, and so that that's obviously going to raise a lot of questions, which will be uh, answered uh, in the, in in the supplements and the other products to come. So there, there's going to be very much of a, of a familiar environment, at least in part, and familiar animals. But there are other creatures. Uh, a lot of them are going to be uh, a nuisance as much as anything else. And there's going to be some exceedingly dangerous creatures out there. Uh, and there's going to there. I'm working on an entire ecology uh, where I want to really showcase um, creatures and uh, flora that I think will will be important and meaningful and will help to um, emphasize to the players and to the guides that that it's not Earth. You know, while you're in the green zone, it looks a lot like Earth. It feels a lot like Earth. But uh, once you get out of that area, it doesn't anymore. And, and there are a lot of unanswered questions. There are a lot of things that are going on and not all of that's going to be shared immediately, but it, it will be in future, uh, in future uh, products as well as, uh, um, as well as the answer of, uh, well, you know, the game starts here and all right, so we've got our characters in here and that's all well and good. Once we play through the introductory module, but then what about later on, you know, how do I bring another character in if this is a splintered fragment of humanity mm -hmm. and there's going to be other ways and those are becoming, uh, those are becoming in, in some future products. Mm -hmm. Now with that, in, with that in mind, what would you, with the books that you have planned, what would you be shooting for as far as the um, page for the page count for the, both the, for primarily for the um, colon the colonist companion, the colonist companion is definitely going to be larger than I wanted it to be. Uh, I wanted it to be ninety six pages, and uh, and it's going to be close to one hundred and sixty. Uh, but uh, but most of that, uh, over half of it, is is more about the the spaceships that are in the game because. Uh, while they may not play a large part, I wanted them to be as realistic as I could make them and make any type of uh, uh, space encounter as easy to role play through and as easy tactically wise uh, to get through as possible because because um, I have noticed that tactical combat, especially in a 3D environment, can be extremely challenging and can be very difficult for uh, for everyone involved. So the page count for character creation and you know, the whole thing pretty much is, is about 22 pages. So it's, it's not a lot. And, um, and combat and gameplay again is not, not all that much. Uh, 
gear is about 30 pages. And then everything after that, the other 80 to 90 pages is going to be on uh, spaceships and on the, the campaign setting. Uh, so it's going to be, I say, close to 160 pages simply because I don't have all the artwork right now. And so that's that's going to impact the actual page count. But uh, but the Colonist Companion is going to be should be the largest of the source books. Mm -hmm. And I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. I, I really appreciate it. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!